Hello, everyone, and good evening. Welcome. Uh, this is an ongoing talk in the Hoag um, educational series. We are celebrating or in um, um, recognition of Heart Awareness Month. And uh, today I'll be speaking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, pun intended, and that is heart attacks. How to recognize the signs, the symptoms, and how to prevent a heart attack. My name is Ethan Arda Yelvak, and I'm an interventional cardiologist. I work out of Hogue Irvine and Hogue Newport. I'm a partner at Cardiology Specialists of Orange County. You can find us at cardiologyspecialistsoc.com where you can learn more about how to make a consultation or learn more about any uh, cardiovascular disease process. So on that note, let's begin. A few disclosures. Um, this is meant to be general information and education for patients. It's not meant as a specific or personal medical advice for you. Uh, for that reason or for uh, in, towards that end, you may want to seek advice from your physician or your cardiologist if you have specific questions that apply to you. I also have some ulterior motives for uh, presenting this. I am tired of waking up at 2 a.m. to do heart attacks and fix heart attacks. So. Um, I'm doing this presentation in hopes that we might be able to prevent a heart attack and also perhaps I might be able to get a better night's sleep. Um, also, one more thing, we've had a lot of, uh, I think a lot of cardiologists could agree that in uh, Southern California we've had a lot of pandemic distraction. Not that the pandemic is not important, it obviously is, but our hearts are also important. Cardiovascular disease is still the leading cause of death. Maybe through the months of November through January, maybe it wasn't, but it will be again. And it's important that patients understand and learn how to recognize the signs and symptoms of a heart attack so they can come into the ER, get into the hospital early, and treat that problem in uh, an appropriate fashion, timely fashion. So let's get into it. Well, so who am I? So I'm um, from uh, Lake Jackson, Texas. It's a small town on the coast of Texas. Um, I did undergraduate training at Rice University. I went on to do medical training at uh, University of Texas. I then went to New Orleans at Tulane. I studied uh, internal medicine for three years, general cardiology for three years. I then, uh, even though I love the city of New Orleans, I felt that it itself was probably too unhealthy for myself. I'm talking about the, the food and the Cajun cooking, which I love. But I decided to come out to the West Coast, was it, which was a good fit for me. Um, I did another two years of advanced interventional cardiology training at the University of California in San Diego. That included uh, an, a, a, um, training in peripheral vascular disease as well as structural heart disease. Um, I was then um, recruited to come up to Orange County. I now uh, am a partner at Cardiology Specialist of Orange County. So there are different types of cardiologists. I think uh, this is a, a distinction that um, a lot of patients don't really understand, so maybe we can clarify a few things this evening. Um, all cardiologists on some level are general cardiologists. They go through general cardiology training, which these days is three years. We then have subspecialties within cardiology. There's interventional cardiology, electrophysiology, um, advanced heart failure training. There might, there's even some other um, uh, cardiology fellowships popping up, other, but, but those are the main um, fellowship trainings that are, are subspecialties of cardiology. Uh, electrophysiologists, those are the electricians of the heart. They manage atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation procedures. You know, we're not going to be speaking about that, um, those pathologies tonight, although they're very important. Um, we do have an electrophysiologist in our group, so that's uh, uh, good, and we work together in tandem to help patients. Um, there's also a, a, a subspecialty of advanced heart failure. Those, patient, those uh, physicians manage heart transplant patients and those with severe heart failure that might need artificial hearts. Again, not a topic for tonight. So tonight, we're going to talk about general cardiologists and interventional cardiologists in particular. Every cardiologist should be a master diagnostician. And what that means is using good history and physical exam skills in combination with laboratory and diagnostic data, they should be able to come up with a diagnosis uh, or identify the pathology that's bothering you or that, that is your complaint. Um, they should then be able to treat that problem and then help prevent it from reoccurring and also treat the underlying disease processes that, that cause that uh, cardiovascular disease process itself. Um, so in regards to interventional cardiologists, we, it is a burgeoning field. It's a very exciting time to be an interventional cardiologist. Um, some interventional cardiologists focus on just a particular area. 
um, most of our procedures occur in a place called the cath lab or the catheterization lab. You may hear me use that later on in the, con in the presentation. The co coronary artery disease is kind of our mainstay. This is the traditional, what you might hear of someone saying, oh, I got a stent in my heart. I had a heart attack. I had two stents, that type of a thing. Um, peripheral vascular disease includes uh, peripheral arterial disease. Uh, that means blockages or narrowings, for example, or disease processes that involve the carotid arteries, perhaps the aorta, the arteries in the legs. And again, you know, interventional cardiologists, depending on their training and their comfort level, may also intervene in those areas. Um, structural heart disease includes um, a newer procedure, newer procedures such as trans catheter aortic valve replacement, which we also call TAVR for short, or perhaps mitral clip, which is uh, another valvular procedure. These are minimally invasive procedures where we go from the leg or from another artery to get to the heart and to actually fix the valve. So why is cardiovascular disease important? Well, it, in a non-pandemic year, it's one third of all deaths. So about 840 to 850,000 deaths per year. We've made great strides in the last 10 to 15 years. We decreased overall cardiovascular death by uh, about 18% and that includes coronary artery disease deaths by uh, 31 to 32 percent. And that primarily came from not only community education, but better and improved pharmaceuticals and improved uh, interventional techniques and management of uh, advanced coronary artery disease and heart failure. Um, a heart attack kills someone every 37 seconds. That represents 13 percent of all deaths. For one diagnosis, one pathology, that's certainly a lot of um, impact on uh, society. The average age for a male heart attack is 66 years, 65.6 years, and the average female age is 72 years. So let's talk a little bit about the types of heart attacks. We like to call, what we call heart attack in, in, as a cardiologist in medicine is acute coronary syndrome. Um, I'm simplifying this a little bit, but a hyperacute heart attack, uh, which we call a STEMI, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. You don't have to remember these things, but it's going to come up here in a little bit. This represents a change in the EKG, the electrical signal of the heart, that suggests that you are having an acute, complete arterial occlusion. That means that there is clot that is blocking the blood flow to uh, a portion of the muscle that is subtended or supplied by a coronary artery. And that clot is acute. It's happening, it's happened very fast. So the body has not had time to uh, compensate for that or has not had time to, to perhaps grow collaterals. This is an emergency and it requires emergent cardiac catheterization. That is the standard of care in this country. Um, so in our uh, field, we say minutes equals muscle. So for every minute that, is, that we delay reperfusion or that we can't get that artery open, muscle dies. And so the ramifications of that is that the longer it takes for us to reperfuse the uh, vessel, the greater the injury and the scarring and the, down, um, uh, the uh, uh, secondary effects that can come from that, for example, heart failure down the line and overall quality of life is very much impacted. So our goals are a door to balloon time of less than 90 minutes. Um, here at Hogue, and I think for the most part in Orange County, I'd say that we're probably achieving a uh, door to balloon time of it probably around 60 minutes or less. Um, what we're really striving for now is symptom to balloon time of less than 90 minutes. But of course, that requires patients be able to recognize the symptoms, part of the reason why we're here tonight. Um, so a subacute heart attack, also known as a N-STEMI or a non-STEMI, represents the EKG changes that uh, show that the, there is no ST elevations, but there may be um, ST depressions. Now, this is a heart attack. It's very serious, but doesn't necessarily need to go emergently to the cath lab in the middle of the night. What we might, uh, what the general strategy is to go for an early angiography strategy. To how early depends on the patient's uh, clinical scenario. If they're having ongoing chest pain, um, rapidly rising biomarkers, which means, um, uh, for example, uh, an elevation of troponin that is going up uh, rapidly. A troponin is a, a, a protein enzyme in, in uh, muscle cells that leaks out when there's injury, so, and we can measure that in the bloodstream. Um, or if they're just clinically unstable, uh, for example, with hypotension or an arrhythmia. So this is another uh, 
diagram schematic that I, I really like. Um, it describes acute coronary syndrome. Um, there are four aspects here. There's stable angina, unstable angina, and STEMI and STEMI. To be fair, stable angina is truly not acute coronary syndrome, but what that represents is that you have a plaque buildup that is considered significant, greater than 70% perhaps. That's what we generally define as significant. And in this scenario or situation, when you are exerting yourself or exercising, you may have a supply-demand mismatch in that. Uh, let's say you're walking up two flights of stairs, your heart muscle requires a certain amount of oxygen and nutrients in order to, um, uh, to do that task. But if that narrowing is significant enough, it may limit the amount of blood flow, particularly in the setting of exertion. Generally with stable angina, we do not see EKG changes uh, seen here on the second row, or, and the troponins are normal. In unstable angina, generally that plaque that we previously described, that significant plaque, is perhaps intermittently opening up, which we call either erosion or rupture, and you are creating a transient clot. That creates chest pain at rest or in certain situations, uh, an equivalent to unstable angina is known as accelerating angina, meaning that you're having angina over a period of time at less and less exertion. These are markers of something that potentially could be, um, uh, something uh, bad could be coming in the near future. So uh, during this, usually we see some we might see some T-wave inversions or ST depressions on the EKG, but again, troponins are generally normal. Now, in an NSTEMI, that's a non-ST elevation, we generally see EKG changes, and we also see an elevation of troponin enzymes, and this means that there has been some injury to the muscle. This is the one that we might actually go to the cath lab the next day, or perhaps you go to the ER with chest pain, you get a little bit of nitroglycerin, the chest pain goes away, you get heparin drip, chest pain's completely gone. We may optimize you overnight and go to the cath lab in the morning. Now, the STEMI, we can see here, this is an ST elevation. I don't have a pointer to show you, but basically you can kind of see those tombstoning um, uh, aspects on the EKG. Obviously, a tombstone sounds bad. Likewise, an ST elevation is not good. And what that means is that we have the total muscle area that is um, subtended by that artery is uh, not getting enough oxygen, not getting enough nutrients, and it's extremely angry. All right, so what is a symptom? A symptom is a manifestation of disease that is apparent to the patient. This represents the patient's complaints. A sign is a manifestation of disease that the physician perceives. So what are the most common symptoms of, or what are the typical symptoms of acute coronary syndrome? Well, chest pain, obviously, but it has a description, a quality of a pressure, tightness, a heaviness um, located in the substernal area of the chest, maybe radiation to the left side, um, epigastric pain sometimes. It radiates sometimes to the arms, to the shoulders, the neck and the jaw, sometimes to the back or the upper abdomen. Um, it is often associated with shortness of breath, sometimes nausea and vomiting. Uh, patients sometimes complain of feeling sweaty and clammy and dizzy. Now, signs of an acute heart attack, something that the, the physician is looking at, the Levine sign is a very um, uh, kind of common um, sign that you, know, you might first learn in medical school. And what that represents is when a patient closes his fist and across his chest, that has some uh, pre increases the pretest probability that there is some level of underlying ischemia in that patient. Diaphoresis, that means sweating, pallor, meaning the patient looks pale. Um, this then you know, proceeds to uh, the patient feeling cold and clammy. Uh, you may see tachycardia and hypotension. These are, as, as we go down this list, these are all signs of worsening prognosis for the patient. It means that this heart attack is serious and that we need to, the patient may be entering cardiogenic shock. For example, agitation and confusion. That means that this heart attack is significant enough that we are now decreasing total cardiac output and there may be decreased blood flow to the brain. So they're getting agitated and confused. And then finally, arrhythmias and PVCs, a premature ventricular contraction. So this muscle tissue is so ischemic and angry that you're getting extra beats in, in, in tissue that is ischemic. And if those extra beats come in a row and they come very fast, that can be a fatal arrhythmia. That's many times why some, uh, many times the cause of why people actually die from a heart attack is a fatal arrhythmia. 
So atypical symptoms, very important to talk about. We see these in women, the elderly, and diabetics. But honestly, I've seen angina and heart attacks present in 101 different ways. Um, sometimes fatigue or just generalized weakness, particularly with exertion. Um, back pain, I have um, kind of a very humbling experience that occurred last year. I had an 82-year-old uh, woman who was very fit, very healthy, had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, but all of these uh, problems were well controlled, and she presented to me complaining of back pain, just back pain. And um, but she was still able to walk two miles a day and was doing her, all her activities of daily living. I actually, she had a negative stress test two years prior, so I felt that she was probably having something else. So I referred her to a neurologist, I believe, and then she came back two weeks later, and she said, Doc, this back pain, every single time I walk up a flight of stairs, I'm getting this back pain, I just don't understand. And then she said it was kind of moving or radiating uh, to the uh, uh, left shoulder. So, um, uh, and with that, uh, I realized that something else was going on. I immediately got a stress test, and the stress test identified multiple abnormalities. We did an angiogram that showed multivessel coronary artery disease. She went on to have a bypass surgery, and she's doing very well now. But this was an experience that, you know, it can, there are atypical ways that coronary artery disease can present. Indigestion is also another way. Um, Everyone, or maybe not everyone, but a lot of us have experienced indigestion perhaps after Thanksgiving when we decide to go for a walk or perhaps go swimming too early. Um, you know, that's not the indigestion we're talking about. If you experience indigestion with exertion on an empty stomach, you know, something may be going on. It doesn't necessarily mean you're having a heart attack, but also if it's not relieved by antacids, you know, it's, it's something to be considered. It may need to be investigated. I have seen angina or ischemic heart disease present with indigestion on numerous occasions. Um, along those lines, exertional sweating or exertional shortness of breath. This is called anginal equivalent dyspnea, and uh, I've seen multiple presentations of that for heart attacks as well. Okay, so let's, before we can get into uh, prevention, let's talk a little bit about atherosclerosis and uh, the process of plaque formation. So atherosclerosis, is a disease process mediated, mediated by inflammation. It is a secondary disease process of other disease processes. Um, it is a sequelae of other disease processes. So it can occur anywhere in the body. When it occurs in the coronary arteries, it is called coronary atherosclerotic disease, or CAD. When it occurs in the peripheral arteries, whether it's in the carotids, the aorta, the renal arteries, the arteries of the legs, it is called peripheral atherosclerotic disease. Um, the most common location for atherosclerotic disease is are the coronary arteries. And uh, it occurs about 60 to 65 percent of all atherosclerosis occurs in the coronary arteries for a number of different reasons beyond the scope of this uh, discussion. But uh, PAD is still a very important um, part of overall cardiovascular wellness. We also manage that um, in our group. So let's take a look at this uh, diagram here. On uh, the left, we see a healthy um, artery. It has an endothelial lining that is the innermost lining. This is where um, the actual vessel receives its, some of its blood flow from. The smooth muscle layer underneath the endothelium, this is what helps regulate uh, the amount of blood flow that goes through an, through an artery. When I'm sitting here talking to you this evening, uh, my arteries are probably normal, but if I were to you know, go for a jog after this, I would have coronary artery dilatation that allowed for greater um, ar arterial blood flow into the muscle, into the heart that was working harder to provide blood flow for the, for the body. Now, in the process of, process of atherosclerosis, we kind of get an invasion of that subendothelial space by inflammatory particles. These inflammatory particles, in turn, attract other in, uh, cells, inflammatory cells from the body that are trying to deal with that inflammation. And in that process, they kind of develop a, uh, a plaque and a scarring uh, process. And over time, this plaque grows in a number of different ways, but it can cause compression of the luminal area of the actual artery, and this is what decreases the blood flow or creates that supply-demand mismatch. And the body oftentimes covers this inflammatory plaque with what is called a fibrous cap. And when this fibrous cap is exposed, 
um, erodes or ruptures and is explo uh, exposed to the bloodstream, we, we can get an instant clot. That's what causes a heart attack or an acute heart attack, is that instant clot of, of the bloodstream being uh, exposed to that inflammatory um, uh, plaque underneath. There are different types of plaques, uh, fibro fatty plaques, calcified plaques, and they present differently and explain the differences in some of the symptoms that we see in patients, but they're all kind of different shades of gray, if you will. And um, many times the, 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 the process underlying is really just an inflammatory process, whether it be uh, something that takes many years, uh, let's say in, in that 82-year-old, or something that takes uh, 42 years in, 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 in somebody who presents with an early heart attack. All right, so one thing I want us to walk away from this uh, presentation, 50% of people who present with a heart attack or an out of hospital cardiac arrest present with, uh, uh, have symptoms or signs that have preceded in, uh, them in the last 30 days, meaning that they've felt something in the last 30 days uh, to, um, uh, that should have been a sign or a symptom that should have, they should have seen that could have gotten them to a physician earlier. And one thing I like to say is exertional symptoms are the canary in the coronary artery. And I know that's cheesy, that's a dad joke, that's okay. But the, but the reality is if you're having exertional symptoms, um, that should be um, uh, something that alarms you and, and can actually save you from having uh, uh, an acute heart attack later on down the road. All right, so what are the contributors to vascular inflammation? Obviously genetics, uh, we cannot run away from our genetics. Uh, we have all of us a number of predispositions and traits that that make us uh, make it either either make us either higher risk for thrombosis or for developing plaque or lower risk. And it's very important that if you do have a family history of early CAD, early CAD is generally considered under the age of 55 years of age. Um, you definitely need to be seen by a cardiologist to or a specialist who can risk stratify you and who can better better advise you. Um, any history of coronary artery disease, quite frankly, familial coronary artery disease is pertinent in my opinion. Uh, dyslipidemia. So high cholesterol, it's also called high cholesterol. This is something that, um, you know, we used to think that cholesterol was very binary. It was very simple. It was kind of a stoichiatric problem that, you know, high cholesterol is bad. You know, we have good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, and, and triglycerides. You want your good cholesterol high, your bad cholesterol low. Well, the reality is, it's much more complex than that, obviously, like all things in life. Um, we have the ability now to actually break down these particles and we can see the different sizes of these particles and we know that certain particles are more atherogenic, meaning they lend themselves to the um, uh, facilitation of plaque deposition and the building of plaque. They are more inflammatory in that, in, in, in other words. Um, there are other particles, apolipoproteins that we look at now, these are certain particles that also lend themselves to an inflammatory state. Uh, so it's very important to recognize that um, if you have a, a lipid problem or if you have a family history of early CAD, you should probably be, be assessed uh, at least for um, uh, with an advanced lipid profile to assess if you have any of those uh, risk factors. High blood pressure, hypertension. This is the number one preventable cardiovascular risk factor for all cardiovascular disease. So. That includes atrial fibrillation, heart failure, stroke, um, coronary artery disease, peripheral arterial disease, renal you know, dysfunction, renal disease, even dementia is related to hypertension. Control of high blood pressure is very, very important. And it is honestly, I think, currently one of the uh, failures of the medical community. We're, we're working on that, and that's part of, partially why we're here today. Diabetes. Uh, it's well known that diabetes lends itself to an inflammatory state. The way you can, this is a simplified view, but the way you can view it is sugar combines with the cholesterol and creates a super inflammatory compound that gets stuck in that subendothelial space and attracts more infl inflammatory cells that kind of propagate and um, accelerate the process. Uh, all of this is subtended by physical inactivity. You know, eating poorly or eating too much and the combination of eating poorly and eating too much combined with physical inactivity allow for these disease processes to take hold. Obesity, specifically visceral adipose tissue, which we call VAT, is uh, uh, an area of burgeoning research right now. We realize that this is a very unique type of adipose tissue. Um, it, it's, it's inflammatory in nature. There's a lot of cellular um, uh, 
communications, chemicals that are produced from visceral adipose tissue that results in downstream inflammatory changes. Smoking, we all know smoking actually causes um, a, an injury to the endothelium. It allows for uh, entry into that subendothelial space and propagates an inflammatory state. Untreated autoimmune diseases, this is often under um, looked. So uh, untreated rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, psoriatic arthritis, these individuals often present with rather aggressive coronary artery disease because overall they have an inflammatory milieu in their body. Um, and all, so there is some evidence to show that if we do treat those autoimmune diseases, we mitigate some of that risk. So that's very important. Uh, chronic infection, chronic untreated infection, for example, HIV, these, these folks develop very aggressive plaques. Okay. So, towards that end, you know, after this pandemic, we're going to still be dealing with this epidemic of heart disease. And it's because all of the underlying disease processes are, are, are getting worse in our country, for the most part. Hypertension, nearly 46% of us have, uh, have hypertension. We're going to talk about hypertension in a second. 10.5% of the population is diabetic. Another 35, nearly another 35% are pre-diabetic. We have 71 million that are defined as being uh, dyslipidemic or having uh, an LDL greater than 130. Um, nearly 40% of our country is considered obese. Um, one good thing, we have reduced the number of our smokers. We've gone from 21% in 2005 to 15.5% these days. Um, also, some studies show that we are becoming a little bit more active. I'm interested to see how the pandemic has affected that. In my uh, personal uh, experience in clinic, I think a lot of people are a, a lot more inactive these days. So that's something that we're going to have to refocus on as we exit this pandemic. So how do we get here? Just briefly, you know, in the 1970s, uh, over 80% of our meals were eaten in the home. And uh, these days, and this is, this is a statistic from 2008, you know, uh, we're probably in the lower 60s, 60% um, 60 of our, our meals are eaten in the home. And so what we're doing is we're outsourcing our food production our, and our, and our um, uh, meals. And in so doing, we're eating the wrong thing because, uh, you know, majority of the sodium, 71% of the sodium that we consume comes from processed foods or restaurant foods. So imagine if you could cut that out, if you could cut out the processed foods, then um, you would drastically reduce your sodium intake. You know, salt for so many years was such a crucial commodity that we used to trade in salt. It we used to barter in salt. It was, a, it was like a currency. People used to say, how much money? When people use this signal or this, uh, this motion, that gesture, it means it comes, hails back from, you know, two, three thousand years ago when we used to say, how much salt are you going to give me for this uh, product? Um, today, we're inundated in salt. The average American male consumes 4.2 grams of salt. The average female, uh, over, a little over three grams of salt. Our recommendations are for less than 2.5 grams of salt. There are a lot of uh, recommendations for less than 1.5 grams of salt. I find that that uh, is probably a little unrealistic for a lot of patients. So I generally um, uh, recommend less than 2,500 milligrams. But there are certain populations, particularly in heart failure and other folks who have severe hypertension, where they really need to limit their, their salt intake to less than 1.5 grams. Um, there are uh, certain individuals that have salt-sensitive hypertension. Their, their kidneys are just very... Um, they're, they're very efficient. They hold on to salt in a way that in modern society is uh, detrimental, but perhaps evolutionarily was a benefit. Okay. Another example of the Ameri average American diet. Um, average American eats 29 pounds of french fries. That means that there are folks that eat more than that, which is scary to me. 23 pounds of ice cream, 57 gallons of soda. Um, you see this. I mean, 600 pounds of dairy, this is, it's, it's just too much. It's, it's, it's too much excess. And our lifestyle also doesn't, doesn't help us. Eight hours a day in front of a screen, you know, that can also, that's, we're not unique in that. The whole world is suffering from, from the, the screen issue. Two hours a day on the internet, 70 to 80% of us don't get the recommended exercise uh, that we should. 40% of us are sleep deprived, um, guilty as charged there. You know, we're, we're all, all of us, may, maybe we don't all consume 24 pounds of artificial sweetener per year, but you know what? I bet you any single person who looks at this, they can find something that they're probably doing wrong. Some of it's unavoidable. You know, it's hard modern day society, but this can't continue. This is, this is a national actually security problem. This is uh, something that can't be continued. Okay, 
So just another example, in 1960, the average uh, male weighed about 165 pounds. Uh, in 2010, 195 pounds. The average female, 140 pounds. In 2010, 165 pounds. You know, we were in 2000, we had 30% of our population was considered obese. Now 40%. Childhood obesity is worsening also from 2000. Uh, we were uh, about 14% now. At, uh, in more recent times, 18 to 19%. So how can you estimate your risk for cardiovascular disease? So for m most patients that come into my clinic, I use a tool similar to this uh, to estimate their atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. Um, this is an example I put together last night. I just created, made up this patient. This is an average Joe that I might see in my clinic. Uh, he's 53 years old, male gentleman, Caucasian, systolic blood pressure of 145, diastolic blood pressure of 85, um, total cholesterol of 190, HDL 40, LDL of 140. He's, a, he's not a diabetic. He's never smoked. He tries to live a good life. He's on, uh, let's say, one medication for hypertension. He's not on a statin and not um, taking aspirin. I'm pretty sure you know several people in your life who have a profile that may look like this. <clears throat> okay, so on the top there, this is the actual calculation. They give this gentleman a 7.8% risk of cardiovascular disease, a heart attack or stroke, within the next 10 years. His lifetime risk is 50%. And so what we, if you actually go through that algorithm, go to that website and do that, you can push next and it'll actually tell you what cardiology recommendations are, the ACC's recommendations are for each of the problems, whether it be cholesterol or high blood pressure. And so this individual has a 7.8% risk for stroke or MI over the next 10 years. And based on the most recent lipid uh, recommendations, he should probably, it says, you can see there, I don't have a pointer, I'm sorry, in the middle there on the top, greater than 7.5%, this individual should be started on high intensity statin after a clinician patient discussion. So what I probably would do with this individual is not start a high intensity statin, perhaps I'd start a low level statin or an intermediate level statin and counsel on some weight loss techniques, uh, some dietary changes, exercise changes, and then we'd have him back in a few months, reevaluate with another lipid profile, assess, look at his blood pressure, optimize his blood pressure. We would optimize his risk factors. Um, that's the name of the game. We want to optimize all of the disease processes that allow for inflammatory changes in the body that allow for vascular inflammation. Hypertension, these are the new hypertension guidelines. There's a lot, of, a lot more people that are hypertensive based on these hypertension guidelines that were recently um, uh, established. So normal is now considered less than 120 over 80. If your diastolic blood pressure is less than 80 and your systolic blood pressure is between 120 and 129, you are considered to have mildly elevated blood pressure. Stage one hypertension now is defined as a systolic, that's the top number, between 130 to 139, or a diastolic, that's the bottom number, between 80 to 89. Stage two is if either one of those is above 140, I'm sorry, if the systolic is above 140 or if the diastolic is less than 90. And what is defined as a hypertensive crisis is if the systolic is over 180 or the diastolic over 120, and generally, uh, if that's going on, you should probably seek uh, medical attention pretty, pretty quickly. All right. There is good news, though. There's a lot of good news. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do in our life to mitigate this risk. So just simple weight reduction. Um, if, you, if you lose 5 to 10% of your body weight, you have a potential for reducing your systolic blood pressure, or you're reducing your blood pressure by, depending, 5 to 10%. So... In this example here on the top line, uh, loss of 10 kilograms has been correlated to upwards of 20 millimeter mercury reduction in, in blood pressure. 10 kilograms is a lot of weight, but consider 10, uh, 5 kilograms or, or 10 pounds or so. Um, you can still achieve a 10 to 15 millimeter mercury reduction in your systolic blood pressure, and that's very, very beneficial. Um, adopting uh, certain diets, such as a modified Mediterranean or a modified DASH diet, uh, the DASH diet is uh, rich in fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy, and products with reduced content of saturated fat and salt. You can reduce your um, average systolic blood pressure of upwards of 15 millimeters of mercury with that. Just simply reducing your sodium intake to less than 2.5 grams 
or 2.4 grams per day can reduce your systolic blood pressure of 8 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Physical activity, 30 minutes of exercise a day, getting your heart rate up to about 70% of what is considered your max predicted. Um, actually, you don't even have to do that. Just 30 minutes of nice brisk exercise, brisk walking a day can reduce your blood pressure of upwards to 9 to 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, moderation of alcohol consumption. If you're drinking more than two drinks per night, you know, you probably should cut that back. It's, it's, it does lend itself to hypertension. Um, if you can cut that to below two drinks a night, uh, you can reduce your systolic blood pressure um, by upwards of five millimeters mercury. Um, there has been an in uptick in drinking during the pandemic, so I'm, I'm hopeful that afterwards we'll be able to get to some normalcy there too. So in summary, we've learned about the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. I hope you all know what to look out for. Um, we've learned to listen to our body and that uh, if we don't do that, it will end in folly. Um, genetics matter. You cannot run away from your genes. Um, atherosclerosis is a disease of inflammation. It is a secondary disease process of other disease processes. And if we ignore those disease processes, I promise you it will result in uh, sec the sequelae of cardiovascular disease. And we talked about optimizing our risk factors which in include diet and exercise prevention, uh, reducing our salt intake or adopting a healthy diet, eating out less. The average restaurant meal is 1,200 calories, um, and also uh, avoidance of processed foods. We want to cook fresh, ladies and gentlemen. That's the, the best recipe. Um, and then also moving every day, exercising, whether it be walking, running, biking, swimming, or whatever you like to do for 30 minutes a day, just do it. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to go into audience questions. All right, we have, is the, da is the data regarding food and diet per day, per week, what is, what is the data? Is that referring to what is the data regarding food and diet? Um, that's for, yeah, for the data that you had regarding food and diet, like sodium and such, is that per day? Per oh, yeah. that's per day. That is per day, yeah. Sodium is per day, so 2,500 milligrams, less than 2,500 milligrams per day is the recommendation. Uh, definitely not the amount of, and definitely less than the ice cream there per year that was highlighted. Uh, why can you sweat and feel cold at the same time? <laughs> uh, well, so, <laughs> so the process of sweating, um, <laughs> there's a, a thing called the heat of evaporation, so you actually lose energy through sweating. Um, uh, perhaps it's also cold outside. That's why traditionally, uh, you know, moms say uh, get out from the cold, especially if you've been running around and sweating in the cold. Um, it's a funny question. I don't think necessarily always pertains to cardiovascular disease. I don't think if you sometimes sweat and feel cold at the same time that you're necessarily suffering from cardiovascular disease. I think that might be uh, 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 an aspect of normal uh, human physiology. Um, does a normal coronary CT rule out CAD? So there are caveats to this question. So what you might be referring to, referring to is a normal coronary calcium score. So a normal coronary calcium score reduces the pretest probability, reduces the chances that you actually might have underlying, significant underlying plaque or obstructive plaque. It is unusual to have a 90% or diffuse plaque without some calcium deposition. It is possible. Very, fibro, very, very fatty plaques in the young can sometimes have a low or zero coronary calcium score. It doesn't, so having a, a, a low or normal coronary calcium score um, is a good thing. It's an indicator that you are unlikely to have significant underlying plaque, but it doesn't completely rule out the presence of, of, of atherosclerotic plaque. Now, there's also a thing called a coronary CTA. A coronary CTA or a coronary CT angiogram is kind of like the coronary angiograms like my, someone like myself does as an interventional cardiologist, but what it is, it's, it's, but it's performed with a coronary CAT scan. That technology is actually improving every year. And uh, there have been some recent improvements that allow us to actually look at the flow in coronary CAT scans. Um, so a normal coronary CAT scan is very predictive of uh, the absence uh, of coronary artery disease. However, 
what they're not great at doing is understanding intermediate plaques. So if, you, they, if the coronary CAT scan, coronary CTA, demonstrates perhaps a 30 or 40 percent plaque, that I've often seen those plaques be either less or actually far greater than. So we're still working on that intermediate um, uh, lesion differentiation. Uh, I hope that answers the question there. But that was a very good question. OK. So regarding cholesterol, if your bad cholesterol is very good due to diet and exercise without the use of statins, but nothing seems to help to raise your good cholesterol, what can you do? That's a, that's a good question, and it's a tough question. Um, so one thing I didn't mention is that so a low HDL is what you're referring to. So the actual number one predictor of early onset coronary artery disease is a low HDL. Uh, when I see a low HDL in a patient, I get much more nervous and, and, and my, um, become a little bit more concerned than, than when I see somebody with, let's say, a very high LDL. There's a lot of people running around out there with high HDLs and high LDLs. And when you break down, when, they, when you do your, their advanced lipid profile, they have um, the profile of someone that's non-inflammatory, meaning that their LDL particles are nice and big and fluffy, and um, they're not really atherogenic. And these people don't necessarily need to be on a statin, even though their LDL may be 190. Okay. However, I get more concerned when I see the 52-year-old with an HDL of 28 and an LDL of, let's say, 100. Um, that, that HDL is something that, that needs to be further addressed, and, and that individual needs to be risk stratified, in my opinion. Um, but you asked, what can you do to help that HDL? They've done a lot of studies to uh, see what can, what can actually reduce cardiovascular risk and uh, cardiovascular, um, major adverse cardiovascular uh, events in individuals with low HDL. Uh, the reality is not too many things increase HDL other than exercise and in some cases statin. So exercise and dietary changes, uh, um, a major overhaul of the type of fats that you consume can increase HDL. Um, so that's, that's the answer. It's hard to do. Increasing HDL is hard to do. Um, generally, people with low HDL should still, could still benefit from a statin. Uh, that's a good question. Do we have any other questions? That's it. All right, everyone, thank you so much. It was very nice being here with you. Uh, we wish you all the best.